Okay, so Hugh, Andrew, thank you very much for taking the time to come on the show and talk to us. Thank you. Pleasure. Very nice to have you on. So uh, let, let's get straight into things. And uh, I wanted to ask you about teaching lexically. So what is it and why is it important for teachers to know a little bit about this methodology? So uh, teaching lexically really is about a way of thinking about language. So rather than kind of splitting off grammar and vocabulary and tending to see grammar as the most important thing, with teaching lexically, we, we think of vocabulary as the most central thing. This is the thing which really improves your language. And But it's then also thinking about vocabulary as being quite complex, that it works together with other words and with grammar. And in the way we teach, we need to reflect that complexity uh, and also in the way we teach, we need to make sure that we're recycling a lot of this vocabulary, revising it a lot. And each time that we revise, we're kind of trying to build our knowledge of how words work. And that kind of leads to, to kind of the, the, the improvements and the way we approach different uh, aspects of our lessons, whether it's speaking, listening, reading. Uh, that kind of thing. You've started up a new school in London, the London Language Lab, and uh, has this teaching lexically, this methodology, has this informed a lot about uh, about the school? Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, well, the school in general, so how you came up with the idea and how it's structured and what makes it a little bit different from other schools? Yeah, I can. We, we, obviously, I mean, we've both been teaching since the early 90s, and I think for a long time, having worked in a sort of wide range of other language teaching institutions, there's always been a little part of us that's looking at what's going on and thinking how we could do things differently or how we could improve on the way things were done. And at the start of this year, we had a sort of chance encounter with someone who had a building that we were offered space in. And so we've got a, a lovely kind of two-story space in the centre of London in Bloomsbury. And I guess what makes us different is partly at the moment we're still a very small school. Um, Partly, I think, the fact that the school's been started primarily by, by ourselves, by teachers, teacher trainers, as opposed to business people looking to kind of turn a quick buck, mm -hmm. yeah. which we, I have heard rumour of existing in occasion within the English language teaching world. <laughs> so they tell me. Um, and I think, yes, the, the methodology that we, we kind of both teach by ourselves very much informs what we're doing in the classroom. Um, I think it's it's basically the teachers that we employ teach in a very similar style. If someone's away and someone covers the next day, you know you're going to get a very similar kind of approach to language, approach to teaching, approach to working from the students. Um, so I think that makes us quite unusual or quite different in a sense. Um, I think the other things that make us possibly slightly unusual are the way that we try to use London. So we're trying to do more than just have a kind of you know, pub crawl, look at Big Ben, Buckingham Palace kind of cultural program. Mm -hmm. We're trying to sort of integrate a more adult approach to London, whereby we teach students language and history about certain kinds of aspects of London. So, you know, we might do a week where we do gentrification and we'll look at some language connected to that. We'll look at the concept. We'll go and visit an area together that's being gentrified. We try to encourage the students to interact with places and people that we're going to. So we try and do sort of projects each week where we're looking at different aspects of the city on mm. top of the actual language classes that we're offering. OK, so you're using the city as a kind of the environment as a resource, in a sense. Yes, yeah, much so. And trying to look at it through many different prisms. So, you know, you might do Jewish London or you might do Muslim London or you might do... You know, uh, green spaces in London or, you know, Gothic London or whatever. Mm. Um, and it, it's trying to sort of allow students to have a, a deeper understanding of a city that can be quite, quite confusing for lots of students when they first arrive. Yeah, so you're basically, you're, it's a different kind of, uh, you're using the city as a selling point rather than being more generic in terms of the language. Yes, very much so. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. No, that sounds fascinating. Um, well, I'd like to move on to, because you guys obviously have a lot of teaching experience, and I want to move on to teacher training and see uh, get, get your thoughts um, first and foremost on the, the state of teacher training uh, today, and then also how you think improvements could be made moving into the future. I, I mean, I basically think teacher training is, is okay. Um, I think the obvious thing to first say is that any initial training course, whether it's CELTA or Trinity or these kind of short ones aimed at uh, native speaker uh, teachers 
essentially they are too short and everybody I think is aware of that so they offer some preparation but you know the, 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 the teachers who come out of them are still in need of further support which they don't always get in other schools that they work with so I mean one area might be actually just to have some post delta courses which kind of are a bridge between delta and delta or, or those kind of initial courses and diploma courses I think maybe speaking as somebody who's interested in teaching lexically and the focus on vocabulary and its complexity I think that those are often initial courses although there's actually a lot of flexibility within them and to be fair a lot of diversity in the way that people do deliver something there, there is exactly. but I think there still can be a tendency for them to focus very heavily on on teaching grammar and you know students of these courses often come out thinking this is the most important thing yeah. and that they need to focus on grammar in each lesson in a, in a kind of fairly structured way yeah when we think about it in terms of obviously vocabulary is more important than what are your communicative goals this lesson yeah thinking about what you want to say in your lesson what, what do you want the, the students to be able to do after they finish their lesson and that often involves more of um, managing both uh, vocabulary and grammar together and I think also um, allowing a little bit more space for students and responding to students so I think that's the other area I think yeah. training could be better yeah is you know both even even in like a diploma courses I think there needs to be a little bit more space for what you might call spontaneous so uh, aware, awareness of a situation, awareness of the students at that time, rather than what you've been taught. And not feeling that you're being restricted in what you can do because you have to achieve a whole set of free stated aims within a kind of very limited, defined period of time. Sure, sure. That it's OK to, to go off on a little exactly. tangent. Yeah, mm. you know, so you respond to what the students say. Maybe a piece of grammar or vocabulary comes up, you exploit that. And that might take you in a completely different route, but it's something where you're following the students um, mm -hmm. and developing their language in that way. Okay, and that's something that comes through the uh, through actual teaching practice as well. You can't be kind of taught that, the, the reacting that way. You can't actually be taught in a pre-sessional course. No, I think that, that that is kind of true. But I think, um, I mean, actually, this is one of the things we're trying to do with, with our book, Teaching Mexically, is that what you need to think about is how you can start to think about that. So what we do is we take uh, individual little parts of the lesson, say a vocabulary task, and think about how you, the kind of questions you ask about the vocabulary in that task, the opportunities you might have to go off on a tangent, mm. to explain that in, in those ways. And you do it in a very narrow way. So you kind of, you might just do it with two or three words where you ask questions which maybe lead somewhere else. And you have a little go at that. And then you can repeat that with any vocabulary task that you do. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you build in, you know, these kind of techniques and develop build. your repertoire of exactly. approaches. So right. that you can that you are more able to become spontaneous, if you like. You know, you need, you need to start somewhere, as you say. You need to, you need, it does come from practice, but you need to have that message that this is a good thing to do, and you need some support in being able to do it better, I think. Sure. But one more thing on the, the whole training courses, I think. Um, there was an article recently by a guy called Jason Anderson in the LTJ, who I think studied native and non-native expectations of initial training courses, and... Unsurprisingly, the conclusion he came to was that a lot of natives look to those courses for language development and language awareness and basic methodological training. A lot of the non-natives are already highly qualified in their own countries and experienced and are looking to those courses to basically be kind of cutting edge methodology. And I think possibly, you know, a, a recognition of this and maybe a separation of what's offered to natives and non-natives might be another way forward. Mm. That's a very interesting point, actually, yeah. But I want to move on to materials writing. Now, you guys have obviously written a lot together. What advice, what's the most important piece of advice you would give to someone, a teacher, who wanted to get into materials writing? I mean, in a sense, I think the, the, the advice would be to start writing. Both of us, long, long, long before we were published authors, were, were writing all manner of uh, juvenilia and trialling it out and, and seeing how it went. I think on top of that, 
a really good way of doing it is to find someone that you can work with, whether mm. that means writing together or whether it means you're teaching each other's lessons. Having someone who you trust, who you're kind of learning the art or the craft with, who you can run things by and who can try things out and who can kind of who, whose constructive criticism you trust and are prepared to take on board, I think is a really, really important part of the process. Because I think lots of teachers can write things that work for themselves in their own classrooms. Writing something that I can pick up and take into my classroom is a whole different skill, I think. So working out how to do that is a really important part of the process, I think. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think any when you when you start actually writing with a publisher or whatever, I mean, you, you need to understand that there's a whole kind of editing process yes. which takes place. And that is vital, even when you, you know, you become experienced and, you know, you think you're producing something basically usable quite early on. Yeah. You still benefit from this kind of input from another outside source, somebody else helping even you. Even if you don't always appreciate it at the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It always improves. It does, yeah, no, it's true. Absolutely. Brilliant. Um, and one one final question for you guys. What changes would you like to see take place in English language teaching in the coming years? Is there anything that we haven't seen, something out of the blue, which you think would make a, a positive impact on ELT? It's a really difficult question, I think. I mean, in, in a sense, a lot of the changes we'd like to see are the kinds of things we've been writing about in our own methodology book. For me personally, the, the big one I'd like to see is a more mature, sceptical and considered overview of the, 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 the merits that technology offers us as teachers. Because I think in the last sort of 10 years, I think it's starting to change a little bit, but I think there's been a lot of overexcitement about what technology allows us to do in the classroom. And I think there's been a lot of sort of rapid experimentation that's come out of this as a result of teachers trying all the, the, the various new tech tricks and tools. And I think often that's overshadowed any sort of real thought about what language am I trying to teach here? What's the communicative goal of this lesson? What do I want my students to be better able to do? And I think often we've been kind of seduced by some very effective ed tech kind of salespeople. I think there's starting to be a more critical kind of appreciation of the, the relative benefits of some of that stuff. But I'd like to see more critical appreciation of that rather than just sort of blind flag waving. But not, not using technology just for technology's sake, actually, when you're using it, considering why you're using it. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, um, listen, it's been fantastic to chat to you and fascinating to hear your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good luck with the school. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to uh, hearing again from you in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Bye now.